Today we're talking about not the democratic national debate? Wow, I must really hate clicks. Instead we're talking about the true biggest winner from last night's debate, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, because nobody is talking about his incredibly controversial rate cut decision. This was the first time in 10 years that a rate was cut, so it's definitely catching some people's attention. Jerome Powell was quick to put people's fears to rest though by assuring everybody, let me be clear, it's not the beginning of a long series of rate cuts. But I didn't say it was the only one. Well, thank you for being clear, said someone who stopped paying attention halfway through that statement. Overall, his press conference was a disaster. Powell repeatedly stammered and fell back on the language in the statement issued by the Federal Open Market Committee. Yeah, it was a real blink twice if you're in trouble type of press conference. Today I'm going to be putting on my detective hat and trying to answer one question. Why? This announcement took some people by surprise because, well, a rate cut is generally something you reserve for a bad economy. And while most people will tell you there's plenty wrong with this country right now, the economy isn't one of those issues. Unfortunately, a Federal Reserve Chairman stuttering his way through prepared lines like an 8 year old trying to perform an M&M song for a talent show, well, that didn't really provide a definitive and satisfying answer to the question of why are we doing this, leading people to speculate a few reasons of their own. Now, Before I start listing these reasons, they are by no means mutually exclusive, so the answer is probably all of the above. Now to the first reason. This whole thing is just a throwback to the 90s. Enter Alan Greenspan, former Federal Reserve Chair and what it would look like if that Six Flags dancer decided to start working for the man. Back in 1995, we were in a similar situation. But overall, the performance of the economy still should be good. We expect growth to continue and inflation to be contained. The Federal Reserve, for its part, will be attempting to foster financial conditions that will extend that good performance through 1995 and beyond. In 1995, Alan Greenspan shocked the nation, or let's be real, the five people who listen to the Federal Reserve in the nation, when he decided to lower the rate by an amount that would be pretty inconsequential if we weren't in a similar situation today. Now this brings us to a term coined by Alan Greenspan that Powell recently used. There's definitely an insurance aspect to it, said Powell, echoing the phrasing that the Greenspan Fed used to describe its monetary policy easing in 1995 and again in 1998. The basic logic here is, instead of causing a recession because you were waiting for a recession to happen before you take action, well, you just give the economy the occasional nudge to keep it going. Though Fed policymakers at the time did not believe the data meant a recession was coming, they did not want to wait to find out. They cut rates three times and the manufacturing sector and job market both regained health. Those rate cuts extended the expansion into 2001. Sounds like a perfect solution, right? I mean, that's when the article ends. We just kept growing until 2001 and then nothing bad happened in 2001 based on Federal Reserve policies. Here's Alan Greenspan again in 2001. History demonstrate that participants in financial markets are susceptible to waves of optimism, which in turn foster a general process of asset price inflation that can feed through into markets for goods and services. Excessive optimism sows the seas of, of its own reversal. I'll translate that into English for you. The dot com bubble burst. Because interest rates were low, so why put your money in the bank when the most value you'll get from them is the free toaster upon opening an account? Instead, give $100 million to Pets.com, a website that sells exclusively pet supplies at a consistent loss. Bubbles happen when low interest rates meet great economies because people have cash to burn and invest. In defending himself, Greenspan said that an interest rate increase sufficient to deflate the bubble would have done significant damage to the economy at large. 
He went on to say, the notion that a well-timed incremental tightening could have been calibrated to prevent the late 1990s bubble is almost surely an illusion. So a perfect model to go off of? Probably not. But hey, it's the one we seem to be using. Take away from this portion, this strategy had successfully been used to prolong growth in the past. But if you see the news talking about a too good to be true investment in the near future, I'll put it this way, I'd hope I'm not working in whatever sector it's a part of. So that's the first theory, we're going to keep nudging this economy along and coast through the next few years. Next we see a persistent and odd problem, inflation or lack thereof. Now this has been a persistent problem dogging the Fed recently, and I made a video all about it if you want a really thorough explanation of what's happening and what could be causing it, link at the end. For now though, we're having this persistent period of not alarmingly low inflation, but the change oil light is definitely blinking. We continue to expect that inflation will return over time to 2%. But domestic inflation pressures remain muted, and global disinflationary pressures persist. Inflation is a huge part of the Fed's job, and sometimes it's easy to forget that they have a dual mandate. Keep the inflation rate at about 2% and maximize employment. Beyond those two things, they legally shouldn't care. So how's that 2% inflation rate going? Well, recently it's hit a bit of a snag. You're probably looking at that drop and thinking, that's nothing to worry about. But the worrying part is, we're not sure why that's happening. I mean, a growing economy, more jobs, higher wages, people should be going out there and spending their money. Have a little bit of fun, create a bubble. But there's a disconnect somewhere in the system. Inflation hasn't hit the 2% goal sustainably since the Fed formally adopted that goal in 2012. Stubbornly low inflation has also bumped up the risk that expectations for future inflation will drift lower. The thought here is, if we lower the savings interest rates that accounts pay and the interest on loans just a little bit, people will spend more money and the government will regain control over the inflation rate. Now before I move on, I know some of you out there are probably scratching your head right now thinking, wait, we want inflation? Well, it's the economic equivalent of touch of gray. You're welcome for the free product placement, by the way. You want just a little bit of inflation on the edges of your economy. And the reason is simple and quite a bit sociopathic. Remember the answer your mom gave you when you asked her, why don't we just keep our cash in a box? Do I really have to put it in a bank? Well, the G-rated version of my mom's response was, if you put it in a box, it will lose value. Outright deflation is dangerous because it causes consumers to hoard cash, knowing that goods and services will be cheaper tomorrow. So this move could be to fight the threat of deflation. Another third reason we might be lowering the interest rate is... It is intended to ensure against downside risks from weak global growth and trade policy uncertainty, to help offset the effects these factors are currently having on the economy. Oh yeah, the trade war is still a thing. Boy, has that been lurking in the background for a few months now. And we're putting new tariffs on iPhones and toys made in China. Well, I guess I know what my next episode's probably going to be about. The logic here is that this trade war is jacking up prices by putting an extra tax on imported products, which means that people are going to be spending less. So what do you do? Well, increase access to loans and the amount of money in the economy. So people will continue to buy things and the economy will keep growing. Now an interesting side effect, if this turns out to be the primary driver of this rate cut, is that the growing view amongst Wall Street economists is that the Fed's embrace of lower rates kind of risks exacerbating a trade war that's now in its second year. Basically, if Trump can rely on the Federal Reserve to balance out the economy as he wages his trade war more aggressively, well, then he can and probably will wage his trade war more aggressively. This rate cut isn't without its controversies as well, as if you watch the majority of Jerome Powell's speech, it kind of sounded like the most boring Trump 2020 campaign ad. Over the first half of the year, the economy grew at a healthy pace, 
and job gains pushed unemployment to near a half-century low. Wages have been rising, particularly for lower-paying jobs. People who live and work in low- and middle-income communities tell us that many who have struggled to find work are now getting opportunities to add new and better chapters to their lives. Sounds like we need to stimulate this economy ASAP. Get me the defibrillator. But sir, he's only here for a checkup. The argument that the Fed makes is, again, we're just focusing on employment and inflation here and the employment rate does not turn decisively higher until just before and sometimes a few months after the beginning of a recession. I mean, if you look at the data, the unemployment rate is a terrible indicator of economic health. In a terrifying realization, it seems to always be very low just before a recession bumps it up. Uh-oh. Now, it would be absurd to panic every time the job market is really good. But the takeaway here is that the unemployment rates generally have a delayed response to economic uncertainties. So that's everything you need to know about the recent Federal Reserve rate cut decision. It might have been motivated by several different factors, starting with an inspiration desire to prolong and keep this gravy train of an economy going. Or maybe it was to boost inflation just a little bit. Or maybe it was to proactively try to negate future slowdowns caused by the trade war currently being waged. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! First, I'd like to give a special thanks to viewer John Clark for expressing his interest in my continued coverage of the Federal Reserve. Click here if you want to see an episode breaking down the Fed's constant battle to control the inflation rate. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into law and economics, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a like if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.